Thank you, Hawk, for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at Neuromat. Uh, so, Antonio asked me to prepare sort of tutorial telling uh, some results about the GL model. So probably I won't succeed. I will just present just maybe two or three results. So the idea is, as I was saying, is just to present without too much mathematics, uh, a few results about the GL model. And precisely what I want to present here, so, so sorry for the experts, I, I just want to present a pseudocode to simulate the discrete version of the GL model, okay? And then, once we, we know that, I want to present a problem of estimating the interaction graph of a interacting uh, neurons, okay? And for, for us, the, the interacting, the, the stochastic model will be the GL model. And after that, if the time persists, I will try to explain very shortly some results related to hydrodynamic, what we call hydrodynamic limits, and maybe others call uh, mean field limits, okay? And the tutorial is basically ba uh, is, is, is based on two papers. One is from uh, Demasi, Galvez, Locherba, which is wrong here, Presuti. Uh, and the other is a joint work with Talini, Galvez, and Locherba. Okay. Please interrupt me at, interrupt me at any time. Uh, so before going to the, the description of the simulation algorithm, I just want to recall you uh, very informally the description of the discrete time uh, version of the GL model, okay? So for me here, N will be always the total number of neurons, okay? And they are evolving in discrete time. So meaning uh, that we somehow we are discretizing the time in very short uh, size bins. And for each mean, I, I, I can um, read it as a time for me. So either I will have a one at that mean, which means that, I mean, xit will be one if neuron i has a spike, at that time t is zero otherwise, okay? Um, I will denote the vit, which uh, will be the membrane potential of neuron i at that time time t, okay? And essentially, the pro in the stochastic version of this model, the probability that i has a one here depends on the vit, okay? Another, another important ingredient for us here, well, it's uh, that, okay, this system is evolving in time, and of course, there is the dependence. Uh, and the dependence is, is, is essentially captured by the, the vector of membrane potentials, okay? What does it mean? It means that if a given time t, I know the whole vector of membrane potentials, at time t plus one, each of the neurons will spike independently of each other, okay? I'm not saying, and then, of course, once I have said that, uh, the model is completely characterized by the probability of neuron i to spike at time t plus one, given it's, uh, in fact, it should be the whole vector here, okay? It's, um, it's, it's, it's a mistake here, okay? More generally, I could put here the, the complete, uh, complete vector of memory potentials at that time. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, so, just uh, to motivate the discussion, okay? No, no, no. It's uh, it's a real number. It's we can think of an energy of the how how excited the neuron is at that time. Okay. Uh, and then this function phi here is it can be well. Of course, I'm I'm not saying saying. Uh, uh, the main assumptions that we can impose to make everything work, but we can think of just an increasing function and that's all for the moment. Okay, just to keep it simple. And of course, the VIT in turns, it's a function of the 
test symbols, x, j, t minus 1 up to time 0. And this uh, depends on all, possibly on all neurons. Okay? So essentially, this is the ingredient. I'm not saying how uh, is the dependence of this guy in terms of all the others. Okay? Is it clear? So I will be more precise uh, on how the VI depends on, on, on X by presenting the simulation algorithm. Right? And, and I will do this now. So the parameters, uh, or let's say the inputs of my program, it's just a matrix of real numbers, which should be modeled in the synaptic weights. These are real numbers, okay? I have a matrix n by n. I, we need to specify a function phi, which we can think of, let's say, a, a spike rate for us. So it's a function on R taking values on 0, 1, because this will be the probability of having a spike given an energy. Okay. And also we'll uh, use uh, some functions, real valid functions on, on, on discrete times just to, to model what is called the leak effect. Okay. So this will be the parameters, essentially. And the only thing that I, I, I need to recall from probability here is what is a uniform distribution number in 0, 1. Okay. Does everybody know this? Or, uh, yes? Okay. It's just to say that, well, uh, you will be said that uh, uh, it's a uniform random number, uniform distributed over 0, 1, if the probability of being at most you is exactly you. Okay, this is why we use this during the talk. Uh, so in particular, once I have this, what we uh, you use in fact is like, if VIT is given, okay, and then I ask what is the probability of my um, uniform random number being at most the phi of VIT, is exactly phi of VIT, okay? So essentially, this is the most important thing for the for the for the for the code. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other, the algorithm is the following. We we need to uh, give an initial condition for the membrane potentials. Okay. V i one. V n zero. And then what we do is the following. For each t, from 1 to, to capital T, let's say this is fixed. I want to simulate my network for uh, capital T times. I do the following. At the first time, for each neuron, I generate an independent random number, ui. And I just ask, well, if this random number is below the phi of vi, vi0, then uh, I said that neuron has spiked at that time. Okay? Is it clear, this? And zero uh, otherwise. Okay? Uh, and then here I'm using strongly the fact that this is a uniform random number because the probability that this um, occurs is exactly phi of this. Okay? as it should be. And then, of course, once I have, the, I have defined that who, I mean, those, those neurons which has, have, have spiked at, at, as first time, then I have to update the membrane potential. And so, in the model, what Antonio and, Gal, uh, Antonio and Eva ha, have proposed is the following. If the neuron has a spike at time T, then VT, VIT is equal to zero. So this is our reset uh, potential, okay? And if not, then how do I update the membrane potential? I take the previous value, and then for those neurons which um, have spiked, I add possibly add a, a value to the membrane potential i. So this value is G0, G, G, GJ0, 
times the synaptic weight. Okay? This is a time zero. Remember, this is only a time zero. Okay? So this is the previous, let's say this is the membrane potential time minus one, or a time zero, if I want to think of. And then how do I update a time one? I just sum or make an average or a linear combination of uh, XIT. You remember that this is either one if the neuron J has spiked or zero otherwise. Okay, so, so the, the J and the T should they be the X, X Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, this is a mistake. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you're right. Okay. So far, so good. This is a discrete time. Um, so what, what you uh, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Let me think. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going but back. The in the yeah, no, no. What I was saying is, uh, at the very beginning, you are you're absolutely right. No, no, it's correct because I his, his I have vit and then hex t plus one. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is like I have V at zero, and then from this I can generate X uh, I uh, one, and then from this I update the V I one, and then I move forward. Okay. Okay, and then for the other T's, the the model is a bit more complicated than that. So the first part, the first part I just uh, copied, let's say. So for other T's, for each neuron, I draw an independent random number, UI. And then I just ask if this number UI is below the phi of VIT minus 1, then I say, OK, I set XIT equal to 1. Otherwise, it's 0, as before. Okay. Um, and now I I need from this to to compute the VIT, the membrane potential. Okay. So as, um, how how do I do that? Again, if the neuron has just spiked, then I set VIT equals to zero. Then here the situation it's uh, uh, more complicated. So otherwise. It, which means that x i t uh, is equal to zero. I have to go back on the past and find the last spiking time of the neuron. So I need to find an L with the following property. Uh, so this is it's missing some information here, of course. With the following property, at that time the neuron is spiked, and from this time. Um, on the uh, xi is equal to zero. Okay, uh, it's not. I mean, it's missing here. It should be xi s equals to zero. Okay. So, in Antonio's uh, way of saying, so this is the last spike in time that the neuron i has spiked up to time t. Okay. Is it clear? I'm not allowed to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. So imagine I, I'm here at time t. Uh, so this is a neuron i. 
And just what I'm saying is, okay, I need to find this capital L. So let's say it's here. Such that here I have a one. And from this time, L plus one up to here, it's all zero. Okay. Of course, this is not a real pro program. I'm just the... Uh, um, but this is what I mean here except that it's missing this, the x i s equals to zero, okay? So this is the first step I have to do, and then once I, I, had, I have found this, this capital L, well, uh, the v i t is uh, given by this formula. So somehow this L cuts the dependence from the past in the sense that I, for I, I forget everything that has passed up to this time L, Okay, so this is, is appearing here. And then again, for each time that neuron, um, again, is wrong, each time that neuron J has spike, a Titan S, the contribution that the neuron I will feel at time T is G of T minus S, because this is the time that has passed. Okay, so say S is here. And here I have a spike of J. So uh, the time that has passed here is T minus S. Okay. And then the, the decay, let's say the decay of this information is measured was modeled by the G, GJ of T minus S. Okay. So uh, I do this whole contribution, contribution along the time L plus one up to T, and at the end I put a weight, which is this WJ goes to Y, okay? Which can be either positive or negative, if the neuron is excitatory or uh, inhibitory. A real number, yes, in principle. Yeah, we can, if we really want to model uh, the, I mean, the liquid effect or something, it should it should be decreasing, or or in time, in time, in time, or even well, more generally, it could be something like it increases and then decreases, right? Oops. And then, and so this is the whole problem that to, we need to, to do to simulate the model. So this is, uh, by doing this, I update from time to time. Um, remember that I have said that the neurons, given the membrane potentials at time t, I can update the, uh, the, I can decide if the neuron spike or not independently. So this is a hidden here in this in the in the sentence saying that I have to generate for each number an independent random number and that's all. Okay? So, so that's in a, in a way like an EEG integrated prior model where you not only reset the memory potential but also the synaptic carbon cycle. Uh, Yes, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, maybe you should take the microphone. No, I mean, I mean of course, there are, uh, well, again, I'm not, About missing information, I'm, I'm not sure. The way they define the model is you in, you just uh, receive information for the other neurons after one step. 
This is why we are not computing anything which happens in L of i, but in L of i plus 1. It's, it's a choice, yeah, for sure. It's the definition of GL model. It's the way they define, define it. It's not, we, we don't want to, to, to take care of the neurons which spike in the same window. This is like a refractory period only. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, there is a big gap between what I'm presenting here in terms of uh, code uh, of a real, I mean, I mean, there is a big gap between what I'm presenting here and what should be a real code. Of course, this is inefficient and it's just to make it easier, the presentation. Yes. In a way, you, you, you your first slide for t equals zero is not necessary because you still have a problem here. Uh, when t equals one, you have to go back to the last spike, yeah. and you don't know that. I mean, so I, we <laughs> I don't like you. I don't like you. No, no, but it's true. It's true. Um, it's in a way, yeah. It's a good point. It's a good point. Uh, uh, <laughs> Christoph is arguing uh, about the initial condition. And essentially, um, uh, no. Yeah, it's everything, yeah, yes. Of course, and then we can argue, ah, can, for instance, this is uh, to simulate the model under some constraints, for instance, like uh, Puzza just said, and even I'm just considering, well, th somehow the, ac the activation from infinity up to zero is um, encoding this V1 and Vn zero, okay? Uh, and then you can ask, well, can we do better? Can, for instance, simulate under the environment uh, regime and so on? And the answer, of course, is yes, but then I would need to explain much more things, okay? Just to give you a very simple code uh, of the GL model, okay? <laughs> okay? So by doing this, of course, what we have is an object like this. If I had simulated, like, let's say, four neurons for a given time, I would have we can think of as a matrix uh, of zeros and ones, of entries of zeros and ones, okay? And then one natural question here is, um, well, suppose we are given um, a spike activity of a population of neurons. I'm denoting here that the notations x1f is just to say, if f is my set of observed neurons, so f x one f will be just this first column, okay? And capital T here is the time that we have observed this this network. And then one natural question, of course. So the, the spike activity depends on the on on the, the the relationship of how the neurons are connected. And one natural question is okay. Given this spike activity, can I infer? the graph of interactions. What does it mean? Okay. And then even, is, is this possible? Is, or uh, what are the natural limitations of such processes? Or uh, what characteristics, characteristics of the process might help or hinder this, this task? So and the point is, if we use a mathematical model, and then you can try to propose an estimator of this, to, to try to understand under which assumptions we can do this, this task or not. Um, try to say what are the characteristics of the process which help, which help or, 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 or don't the task of inferring the graph interactions, okay? So what I want to do now, I don't know how much time do I have? Okay, good. So we just want to present for the GL model what we could define as a graph of interactions and propose a very, again, just, a, just one possible estimator for, for this graph of interactions, okay? 
So for us, I could define VI. Uh, remember, these are the synaptic weights. I could take the set of neurons in, in which this synaptic weight is different from zero. Okay. I remember this can be either excited positive, and then we say J is, is exciting I, or if it's negative, I'm saying that um, J is inhibiting I. And then our question here is, in fact, uh, I can formalize in this way. I fixed a neuron in F, which I have observed activity. Um, and then let's say that this, this activity was generated by the class of the GL model, as I just uh, presented. Okay. And then the question, can I recover the set? Can I recover the set? Is it clear, the question? Uh, and basically what we need to do is, um, is to compare What I need to do is to compare uh, the probability of xit to spike given uh, given either its membrane potential time t minus one, which depends on the spikes of the other neurons, right? So, uh, so uh, I will do this picture here just to remember. So, and then remember potential of the neural i at time t minus 1 depends of something like I have to specify first uh, where was the last time that neural has spiked and then have a zeros here and then some configuration of spikes of zeros ones inside okay so okay So, so this is the picture you are seeing here. So to say, to compute the probability of I to spike at, that, at, that, at this time, I need to compute how excited it is at this time. And this depends essentially on the configuration W, which is here. Because here, um, the last time, the last spiking time of neural I was here. Good. Uh, and the idea, so let's say that I want to check whether K affects I or not. Then one very, maybe naive, oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, but in fact, I think you, you don't depend on all these blocks, but only on the ones in the block. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was, I was just saying, just saying, okay, first, um, the probability of uh, neural I uh, to spike here at this time it's a function of this configuration yeah 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 but yeah sure but I'm saying okay to compute how excited it is it I have I'm obliged to look to the uh, configuration of this size And so to test whether this neural K in fact is affecting I, we could, what one could try to do is, okay, suppose I, have, I find another configuration uh, in the sense that uh, neuron has uh, type, the last spike in time has size four, as in, the, in this example. J has the same pattern of spikes here L has the same pattern of spikes here, and here K I changed, or I, I put more, more ones here, okay? So if I compute, if I compare this thing minus And here I put another configuration 
which is, let's say, compatible with this one, in which sense? In the sense that only I have a, so let's say here is, this line here corresponds to the kth neuron, okay? And then what I'm saying here is, is outside this line, everything is the same configuration and inside is different. So, at least in the GL model at the th theoretical uh, level, if K affects, I'm sure that there are patterns, different patterns like this, in which this difference is uh, strictly positive. And of course, this depends on WK goes to Y. If this is very small, so this difference is small. If it's large, it's larger. If it's zero, it just doesn't change. Okay, this comes from the, the GL model, the, the way we defined. Yes. No, for the moment I'm speaking about that theoretical level. Because I said, well, the probability of I to spike depends on the VI, T minus one, and this in turn depends on the pattern of spikes that we see hidden here. And then, so if K, it's really doing, uh, it's affecting I. So I could try to test this comparing two compatible configuration, which are, um, have a distinct patterns of ones and zeros only on the, uh, let's say on the raw K. Okay. In that theoretical, le theoretical level, I can prove for you that this difference depends on not only this, depends strongly on this WKIJ, okay? Yeah, and yeah, okay? So this, for the moment, there is no statistics, just probability. But of course, as a statistician, our, uh, we don't know the through law. We can just, at most, uh, estimate it right from the data. And then the job is, okay, once I have this kind of property, the only thing I need to do is to estimate these guys, these quantities. If I estimate it very well, I, I still be able to detect whether K or not is affecting I just comparing these guys. I will have this difference plus some error, let's say. And if this error is very small compared to this, um, we can have a beer at the, at the end of the day. Okay? So the next slide is just what I just said. So how do I estimate this probability that I was drawing there? It's just uh, for each pattern W, well, so remember for me W is something like this, but of course it depends, its length it depends on the, the size of the last spike in time of neuron I. Okay. So we can, let's say, fix uh, this number, small L, and then this will induce the size of the, these patterns. And what I can do is, for each pattern of this size, I count how many times it appeared in my sample. Okay, is it clear? And then I can, count how many times this pattern has appeared and I had spiked just after, okay? Like here, for instance, this will be an example. I have observed this pattern here and then I uh, had spiked just after, okay? Uh, well, let's let's forget about this for the moment and then the, my my, my estimation for my probability, conditional probability over there, is just the number of times I have observed that pattern and I has just spiked, divided by the number of times I had I have observed that uh, pattern. Okay. And um, here I'm just imposing a condition that uh, I have observed. I had. I'm will only consider patterns which appeared. Um, significant, significantly often in my sample. 
Okay. So uh, here probably is another mistake because the time that we have observed is capital T not small n. Maybe let me write at this. So the sample, this is given for us, remember. This is the only information we have from, from the model, okay? So T is the time that we have observed and F is the set of neurons that we have observed, okay? And here what I'm saying that this small n should be the capital T, <laughs> okay? Okay, so this picture is just what I was describing there. We'll compare the empirical distribution of patterns of this this type, okay, to test whether J is affecting I or not, okay. So I'm just jumping. And then um, our test is essentially doing the following. If I take for each pair W and V, which are compatible in this sense, here should be K, not I, sorry. Uh, then our test do the following. If the, the empirical conditional probabilities are greater than some parameter epsilon, let's say. If they are large, so for me large is being greater than this epsilon, okay? Then I say that K is in fact affecting the neuron uh, I, okay? But of course, if I find some patterns which, where this um, quantity is zero, it, mean, it means that I have to test another pairs. I have to test for all possible pairs uh, this difference. If for some pair W and V this is greater than, than epsilon, and then I see that uh, K is in fact affecting I. This is according to my test, okay? And then at the end, this procedure uh, that I just described is just define the set VI hat, which is from all neurons that I have observed, I take those which that test statistics is greater than epsilon. Okay? And that's it. So just an example, imagine that I, just to Im imagine that I, I have this sample or only three neurons, and then I can say, well, I can compute, I, Imagine that I have this blue configuration here, zero, one, zero, okay? And then I go to my, through my sample and we can check that the number of times I had this blue configuration in neuron I has spiked is equal to, equals three. So here, here, and here. And the number of times that it, it appears, it occurred in the sample was four in this case. So in this case, the p hat one, given this blue configuration is three over four. I can repeat, for instance, the same process for a different configuration. Recall here we had a one uh, in the zero, and here we, we have a zero uh, on the zero, on, on the two. I can repeat the procedure to estimate that the p hat is equal to uh, two over three, let's say, okay? Um, so this is the picture together, together, and then at the end, in this case, I can compute the difference, and the difference is equal to 1 over 12, and if my parameter epsilon is, is indeed less than 1 over 12, I would say, according to my test, that 2 belongs to the estimated uh, uh, graph, okay? So this is essentially the procedure. Is it more or less clear? Yeah, about, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I guess you need. Uh, I should. Uh, I'm sure that this is uh, written in the paper. I don't have the numbers in my my head. 
but maybe t square on t is t square and maybe maybe it's t square times f of this order the the number of operations that you need to implement to compute the v hat something like this of this order okay so there is uh, so all these is just to say well I have this method and then you can you can ask well what are the, the the theoretical guarantees that you, you we have under this scenario so we have a theorem saying that under um, as under very general assumptions uh, I can say well what is the probability of I, I take a guy here in f containing v and I'm saying that uh, so in sense j is not important i'm saying this is important i can quantify what's the error so this is will be the type one error if you want to say okay i can quantify this we also can quantify let's say the type two error in the sense that well what about if i take a guy in vi and then what's the probability of this guy is not in my estimator i can quantify this also okay and the only very strong assumption here, yeah, I'm missing in the notation, the VI, I guess, do you remember the definition of the VI? It's just those neurons which really affect directly. And the assumption that I'm doing, which is very strong, let's say, like here is the set of neurons that I have observed. We can think that this W goes, uh, J goes to Y induces a graph. That's that's the way we think, right? There's an edge pointing this direction if the J goes to I is different from zero, okay? And that the assumption, what I'm saying here is when, what I'm posing here very, very importantly is if vi is containing f, what does it mean? It means that the set of neurons which is really affecting i, I am observing all these guys. Okay? I'm observing all neurons which are really affecting i. And this is a very strong assumption. Okay? Uh, yeah okay that's so this the more the, the the most important things here is just we can we have the control of type one and type two errors of our estimator okay um, just a few comments before coming to the last part is well this method is it it works let's say in great general in generality in the sense that we are not assuming a specific form for phi not for the GIs, just a few assumptions, very general assumptions. Uh, we are not specifying that the system has to have only one invariant measure it can, and can be used for other um, scenarios. Um, here, it's important, we are not estimating, it's just a more comment than pros and cons, it's just we are not estimating the weights, but only the existence or not of, of, of interactions, okay? if you. Who are interested in estimating the, the precise value, we cannot use it, this method for the moment. Um, and then the mo most important thing is like usually when we observe the data, of course there are information from outside that we are not observing. In this scenario, of course, we have some results, but they are much less sat satisfactory than the, in the good case. Okay. So this is very important, and this is something that we should uh, work on in the next future, okay? Uh, okay, I don't know how much time do I have, maybe 10 minutes, 15, okay. So now I want to switch from this, I mean, if you are, were not interested at all in what I was saying <laughs> up to now, you can, <laughs> we can we can 
uh, forget about everything. Then I want to say uh, something about the continuous time description of the GL model. And, um, and again here, the, the model, the informal description of this model now is, I have again capital N neurons. They are evolving continuous time and I'm uh, describing the evolution of the membrane potential of each neuron again, but now time is continuous. Okay. So this is we already know. And now changes from the discrete time to the continuous time description is like is now is uh, I I have to I won't say what's the probability, but rather I would say what's the rate in which the neuron spikes. So now phi of vit is the rate in which the neuron i spikes at type t. Okay, it's just an very informal. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah. R plus. Yes. Maybe locally bounded in the sense that it has to be integrable. But anyway, yeah. You're right. Sorry. Um, so the important features here for the model is whenever the new eye spikes, we again are setting its um, membrane potential to zero. So this is the resting state again for us. Uh, we are, I will present, we have other results, but we will present in the case that we have a mean field type of interaction meaning that whenever this neon I spikes, it will give one over n for the others. Okay, it's a very strong assumption, but we can relax it a bit. Uh, and through time, so this is our, like, it's what happens uh, are very, um, uh, this is our not deterministic, not deterministic events, okay? This only happens when the neurons, uh, when the neuron spikes. And through time, continuously, we have two things happening. The first one is that the VIT is attracted to the, the, the mean value of the membrane potentials, okay? That's rate one. And also, each neuron is being pushed towards the, its resting potential, which is zero, okay? If you want a more, just a more precise definition of this, maybe I should take the razor. So we, you could ask what is happening uh, to the VIT, let's say. Okay. And then I'm saying, well, whenever, I mean, between spikes, the system is deterministic, following uh, some ordinary different differential equation, which is described uh, on this VI is attracted to the average value, and uh, VI is also pushed towards to zero. Okay. And then when there is a jump, Let's say if this neuron has spiked, then it goes to zero, okay? And then it will, to, it will increase towards the average, and this evolves a long time. So uh, let's say here is another spike in time, but not from V, from J, it will uh, jump by one over N and so, and so on, something like this, okay? So this is, will be the trajectory of this guy. And then you, what you could ask here is, okay, I fixed a capital T now here, and I want to ask what is the limit of behavior of this model when the size of the network goes to infinity? But T is fixed. I fix time, and then I want to know what is the behavior of the system when the size n goes to infinity of this of the system. Okay, which is a sort of law of large numbers. If you want to to, to translate for a probability theory, let's say. Okay. So usually, how this is done 
uh, we defined uh, as we do in probability statistics we we define the empirical measure okay so the empirical measure at time t is just uh, well it's one over n then the sum for each i to n I give mass one over n at the position v i t. Okay. Is uh, it's like when whenever you have a sequence of random variables, x n. And then the law of large numbers says that one over n of this converges to a deterministic object, object right? So I take the empirical average of this. This will converge to the expected value. Let's say this is always x. Iid. Right, so this is the law of large numbers. We can take we take the empirical average of this. This will converge to a number, right? So, so what I'm doing here is essentially, uh, yeah, okay. And then you can say, well, this is the classical version. Then I could say, well, I have one over n. I could consider functions of these guys. And under good conditions, I would expect that this converges to this, right? And this I can rewrite, if you want, as um, an integral. Well, <laughs> an integral of f with respect to this d uh, mu n. And this mu n is the empirical thing that I'm writing there. Sorry? Uh, no, 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 I can write it this way. Um, I mean, if I had delta of xi, delta of xi. Uh, f is here. Yeah, delta is uh, well, delta of a given number is uh, applied to a given. So this is a, will be a function now for me. It's uh, it's one if y is equal to a and zero otherwise. Right? When I integrate a function with respect to a delta function, is f at that point. So I'm just rewriting exactly this. No, 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 no. It just is a general thing. Okay? It's just to just, I mean, to explain why it makes sense to consider objects like this. <laughs> Um, yeah, you could write th this way also. This is a, I think it's true. Yes. <laughs> Anatoly is supporting me, so. Uh, <laughs> Okay, 
So in fact, what, when people say, what, um, what does it mean, hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic limits or mean field limits, it's just a very fancy, fancy um, law of large numbers. Okay, this is a way of uh, thinking about this. So for us, um, for each time t, I define, so my empirical measure is this guy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then the point is I want to prove that this converges to some object. Okay. Um, and usually what people say, well, this guy will converge to a density, to a density, okay, under uh, a density hot T, under uh, some conditions that I'm just, I'm just uh, uh, not giving you in details. The only important thing here is that at the time zero, this guy, these guys, this guy, they are IID distributed according to a given initial condition. Okay, as is in the law of large numbers. If initially I, I choose independently, identically distributed the, the membrane potentials according to a given guy, I'm saying that plus other conditions, I, we can prove that this, we have a law of large numbers in the sense that this guy mu i t will converge to a density rho t. Okay, who is this guy? So this is very, Maybe this is complicated. So rho t is a function, rho t and u. And it, this is, is giving me a time t, rho t of u is the density of neurons at time t having membrane potential very close to u. Okay? And if you consider the GL model, we, we proved, or they, they, they proved, that this limited density satisfies the following uh, PDE, okay? And essentially what this is telling us is like, okay, the density is moving through time. We have this last term here, because whenever, first, first, sorry, first. So this is phi of u for TU is the fraction of neurons spiking at time T can think of this. And whenever they spike, they move their membrane potential to zero. So that's why I have this minus sign here. I'm losing mass. I mean, neuro, neurons with membrane potential U are spiking and they, they go to zero. Their member, membrane potential go to zero. So I have this minus sign explaining this. Okay. And then I also have a drift of potential. Because remember, I said between spikes, I have a drift in my system. It's followed by an ODE, right? I didn't, exp I didn't write it, I didn't explain in detail, but I have a drift a long time between jumps, okay? And this term here is, in, is um, it's explaining is exactly this, this, um, this part. So V, U, I, T, I will define just in a moment. And so this is the fraction of neurons um, following this, the flow <coughs> induced by the deterministic um, characteristics of, of uh, the microscopic process. And at time zero, of course, my density is specified by this rho zero that you have to choose, okay? And who is this V, U, rho T? So this depends only on the energy and the density at time T. So I have this minus alpha u because, well, I didn't say, oh, actually I said it. Remember, vit is pushed towards to zero at rate uh, alpha. So this is translated here to have this minus alpha u. And I also, I have said that this vi is attracted to the average value of the system. So how do I translate this at the limit? I translated like, if my membrane potential is above the average value, then I lose some mass. I distribute mass for the others. If it's below, then the sign is positive. I'm somehow receiving mass for the others to be close to, in order to be more, to be closer to the average value. 
Okay. So these two characteristics were already in the microscopic level, microscopic description of the model, and now I have only the plus, the, the PT, which is the contribution to the, the spikes. Okay? Because now, since I have an infinite number of neurons, there will be always one neuron spiking, so I have to add this deterministic drift due to the spikes. So I'm calling PT. So the only thing that remains to to define here is um, to say who is this PT. PT is, uh, I have to compute only the firing, uh, the average of firing of spikes at time t, which is this guy. Okay? Because I'm integrating over all energy the probability of the mass of neurons close to you at time t multiplying by the phi of u, which is the rate to spike. All right? All right? And the, the average is just the average value. Okay? Um, well, so again, this is my, I have only one more slide, but in terms of mathematics, this is my last, last slide. So as just to said one more time, this is just, I can think of either uh, a very fancy, let's say, uh, version of law of large numbers, or you could say, well, this is, um, this, sorry, the whole T is the, the the, 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 the limit object of this mu i t, and this row gives you the microscopic des description of my system. Okay. So whenever you want to look at a, a large scale, you have to study, if you want to understand a large scale, your model, you have to study this PD. Okay. Yeah, we need to think, well, we, I need, I would need to speak about weak solutions and so on, it's not so uh, friendly. Yeah, you, you cannot, I mean, at least under their assumptions on, on their theorem, you cannot guarantee that you have a strong solution, only weak solutions, and then you have to blah, 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 make a lot of work. And so just three comments is first, as we can do here in the basic uh, probability, I can give you the rate in which this convergence takes place. They also can do it. Not uh, they, meaning uh, Eva and uh, Fournier. They have done it this in 2016. Um, they, ha they have studied the stationary solutions of that PD. Okay. Also, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, well, we can also ask to Guilherme that has also simulated this and also study uh, similar problems, right? Um, in, and as expected, since we have this mean field assumption, they, they have proved also this propagation of chaos, meaning that if you take two neurons and study their correlation a long time, this correlation decays to zero when n goes to infinity. So, so they have also proved all these things, okay? Um, and then you could ask me, well, what about spatially structured interacting neurons? We also can introduce this in the model. We can introduce the notion of distance and so on, so that we can uh, think in more uh, detailed uh, network neurons. So this is joint work with Alini and uh, Andreas Rodriguez, uh, where we, we studied the GL model with this spatial structure incorporated in the model. Um, also here we have, if you want, if you are interested in mean field limits for the discrete time version, you can look at the paper of uh, Hockey, Ozami, Ludmila, and others, uh, Ariadna, Stolf, okay? Um, so just before, yes, yeah, sure. So isn't, isn't this um, a bit boring that we should say that in the, in the large n limit uh, the correlations go to zero? Because 
because usually one, one takes this limit uh, in order to simplify the equations and, uh, and der derive the simple expressions. Yeah? Yeah, so now, when, when the outcome is that the correlation is zero, while we know that in nature it's not zero, it means that you have taken the wrong limit. Uh, it, we, no, this, yeah, I agree. This means that this mean field type of assumption, it's uh, not good for describe the real networks. Because that's true. That yeah, that, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, so, just to summarize, what I wanted to, uh, to say this morning is just, okay, one simple way of simulating, not efficient at all, <laughs> Uh, the discrete time version of the model, then I wanted to say if one result in terms of statistics is this graph interaction, okay? So this, of course, this method can be implemented on, on real data, but it's, uh, it has to be improved in many, many directions before, before turning it into a very robust uh, test. Okay, and and then at the end, I just wanted to say also that for this, for the GL model, we are able to prove this uh, mean field limits or hydrodynamic limits for the GL model under, of course, some assumptions that I'm putting uh, outside the uh, is <laughs> under the carpet. Okay, so thank you for the attention, and that's all. <laughs>